What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of the What Now Show. Um, and you know, before we begin, you know, a lot of you have been giving me a lot of constructive criticism. And you know, for those few viewers that have actually been regular on this podcast, um, you know, all of you have been sliding into my DMs recently. You know, you've been telling me that you know have some other people on. You've been doing the MMA stuff for a while, and it's true. You know, um, we do like to expand more than just the MMA bit. And in fact, we have a pro wrestling fan. We have a stand-up comedian. He, he's put out, a, put out a one-hour, uh, six-part uh, special. Uh, it's on YouTube right now on his channel. And it's his name. Uh, his name is Danny Jollis. He's the first guy who's ever pronounced my name right. What's up, Danny? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right, man. How are you? What an intro. Yeah, uh, Got me fired up. Yeah, hell yeah, man. I mean, it's a pleasure to have you on. And, you know, it's kind of a breath of fresh air. You know, it's, you know, there's so much more to talk about now. I mean, it's, it's not like there's one bit that's been there with the MMA scene, but it's a whole new world when it comes to stand-up comedians and pro wrestling and whatnot. So, oh yeah. Yeah. So I, I do want to go head to head, uh, uh, head on with, you know, the special that you've released recently, right? Uh, the six part special. And it's been out for a little over uh, about a week and a half, two weeks now. And, yeah. uh, you know, I was just wondering, um, I went through a few of the comments uh, in the section, uh, Section, uh, you know, it was a lot of positive feedback. You know, some people went and uh, you've pinned it on the top. You, someone went and found your advert for one of the references mm-hmm. you had in there. You know, it. I mean, people have been going crazy behind it from what I've seen in the comment section. So I was wondering on uh, behind the scenes from like uh, friends, family, different, different critics, what's the kind of response you've gotten? The response has been, you know, it, it's, it's still so early with a special on YouTube. Like it takes a while because it's also, you know, it's not just putting out a YouTube clip. It's like, it's an hour of someone's life. You're asking them to give you, that's a lot of time. So it's like, it's going to be a slow build. And I knew that going in. And so almost 20 K views in less than two weeks is to me, very like <clears throat> more than I could have more than I certainly would have expected. Um, and the response has been so positive. And I think it's, you know, partially due to the fact that, you know, we really made something that was, you know, we, we, at the time we were like, this is going on TV, had the option to go on TV and then really, or streaming, you know, that like with a name behind it. And then I just was like, I was like, I just don't think people watch it anymore. I think YouTube is where people actually watch things. So it was a real, it's been scary. I mean, it's been really exciting, but it's also been scary because it's like, boy, oh boy, I really need people. Because if nobody watches this thing, I'm going to be the dumbest human to ever do stand-up comedy. Because I turned down so many simpler solutions to do this YouTube route. So many easier routes. But I, so, so far it's been going great, but it is just, it's stressful. Watching yeah. view count, yeah understandably so i completely relate to it because you know every time i put out one of these videos i you Mm -hmm. know go to youtube studio i click click and refresh is there one more view holy shit that's one more view is there one more like Mm -hmm. holy shit that's one more like and you know and when i don't see that one more view on the next refresh i just get kind of bummed out for a second then another one comes in and i I completely understand how that feels and you know and and you know what's been very interesting about what you said that really uh got to me right now is that the part about keeping one hour of that person's life right but here's where here's the part that people don't see people don't see the amount of hours of the producer's life that's gone into the production of this and you know Uh whether i've been watching quite a few podcasts with different stand-up comedians as well for the past few months and whatnot and you know what and from because I never realized how hard it was to write my own material, uh, write one's oneself's own material, until I actually tried it myself. Uh, so back when I, uh, so about last year, a year before for this uh, for this high school fest, right? And I had this I had this little competition, the stand up comedy competition. Um, and you guys, and you had to, you know, prepare like this five minute thing. You had to, you know, uh, it was, they gave us some theme. I don't know. I don't remember what it was, but you know, you had to prepare this little bit, five minutes. There would be like two, three judges. They judge funniest guy wins. I don't know how they judge that, but even, even the person who got the most laughs didn't win. It was very weird, but that's not the point. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I, listen, every stand up comedy competition I've ever done was won <laughs> by somebody who I was like, what? Are, what? It's, it's there's no good winner ever in a stand up comedy competition. And I've been in two million in my life. Exactly. All right. That that makes it better for me to explain this to you, because, you know, I got the call to do this by this friend of mine. Uh, she called me at about 11 p.m. the night before, and I had to go on stage at about 930 in the morning. So I'm wondering. Not a great time for stand up comedy. Not a good time for stand up comedy. 930 in the morning. Yeah, and back at that period of time, I mm-hmm. was a late riser and um, a bit of an early sleeper as well. So I don't like staying. I did At that period of time, I didn't like staying up and I didn't like waking up. So, you know, at, <laughs> at, the, at that point, at that, <laughs> so at that point, at that point, I'm wondering, what the hell do I do? I, I, I'm telling them, no, I don't want to. And, you know, I got threats. I was insulted. And then I was they pleaded with me and it, it, like every different stage of uh, convincing took place within a, within a span of five uh, of a five minute call. And it concluded with me saying yes to something. I don't, I didn't know what I was getting where I didn't know what I was getting into. And I just started going through YouTube and I was going through these different skits and uh, these different bits. And I thought, shit, I have to write my own bit. I don't know what to do. I tried to come up with something original. It was, I mean, there's no sugar-coated word for this. So I'll just—it was dog shit, right? And I, I couldn't use it. Um, I tore the piece of paper up, chucked it in the bin. I found like this little less popular stand-up comedian somewhere back in in like the deep depths of YouTube that you had to like scroll for five minutes and then you'd get there. Like I had like forty-five views, okay. And then I and keep that forty-five views in mind, right? Um, I, you know, took down a few notes of what that guy said. And, you know, it was some pretty hilarious stuff. I was just hoping I got the delivery right. I went up on stage, you know, I showed them my material and said, you know, I, I, you know, I tweaked it a little bit. I took the entire thing and went up on stage, um, performed it. I got a few laughs at the beginning. Um, and, you know, there's a, another guy at the back of the audience screams, your zipper's down. And I actually went to look. That's what was the funniest part of the entire bit. Something I didn't say. Right. Mm-hmm. Everything ended. I got off stage and he goes, you plagiarized it. And then I'm like, what the fuck? How do you, how, how do you know? And then he, and then he shows me that the, f- the very first search was that same guy. And it had like a million and a half views. And I found a shitty re-upload with like worse quality (laughs) with like 45 views. And I kicked myself and I was wondering, holy shit. But I realized after which I watched this uh, episode of the JRE and I was like, this, you, you takes hours to write like five minutes worth, uh, worth of comedy. You have to test it on like three, four, with three, four different audiences and three, four different comedy clubs. Uh, You have to, you know, way more than that. Yeah, some yeah, way more than that. And if it doesn't work, scrap it, write something else, and put it together. And then I start compounding all of that together. I'm, and, I'm, and I'm wondering that you know, you're putting so many different uh, pieces, jokes, and trying to string them all together, find the correct transitional phrases, keeping the uh, keeping the audience engaged during that time, and then putting an entire one hour piece out there. You know, it really developed my respect for the art. So which which begs the question, which is what I want to talk to you about. When you're developing your material, when you're considering the different facets through which you want your information to come in and you want to disperse that to your audience, to your viewers, uh, in a humorous manner, how, what's been like your success ratio? Like, okay, this joke works, I'm going to put that in. This joke didn't work, I'm scrapping it. What's that whole, uh, you know, the trial and error process been like for you? Well... So it's like, so every joke has a different journey and every joke takes anywhere from like the Matumbo joke, which is the only joke I've written that was day one worked, like set it done. That's probably the only joke that that's ever happened with. And then, you know, there's even jokes that I would say like you would, we would call successful here where we'd be like made it into the special, uh, but took me months and months and months of saying it that didn't work saying it now the first part works but the second part sucks saying it now the second part works but the first part doesn't make sense anymore 
saying now that now we added a third section and the second part makes no sense because the third and it's just you just are cobbling and working and it's it just takes so long sometimes the wrestling joke is the one you know you've referenced so i'll say that one like i mean that one took me so long because it was initially this rant about how much it must hurt then it was like well no no no, because it's an art form then it was like this separate rant about the rock. Then it was like, if I can put these two together, it works even better. But then it was like, how do I get there? And then I used to have this whole thing about, I used to have this whole thing about like the rock do it like this extra bonus thing about what the rock would do in the ring, like really describing a match. Nobody cared, had to cut that. It just takes, so it's all that. It's just trial and error. As far as jokes that never make it, there's tons. Um, but even the jokes that make it, there's so much failure involved. Stand-up comedy is mostly failure. It's 99%. You go on stage, you say something, and you're like, okay, that did, didn't work. And then you just re you just retinker. And that's not including the first like four years you're doing it where you're just bombing and it's just terrible. Yeah. And you're so, just like, okay, so none of this is good. So when let's say you've had that bomb fall on you and you're on stage you had a joke mm -hmm. that would lead to you know a series of discourse that was supposed to lead to even other funnier responses from the crowd when that part bombs and the crowd hasn't reacted and you don't know where to go ahead from there when you, but you're still up on stage the mic's still in your hands the spotlight's still on top how are you getting through that situation like how are you gonna tell the crowd hey yo look i fucked up I don't have anything else, but I need to figure something out. How are you going through with that? So it takes, so that's like where it takes years, right? Cause your first couple of years you're bombing and you're like, cause the thing you learned very quickly is you can't do somebody else's material one because it's wrong, but two, because it doesn't yeah. work. Cause it's not your voice. Like okay. he can say these jokes and it works cause it's his voice. It's not your voice. Yeah. So you spend your first couple of years in this very weird, like you're trying to be a stand-up comic, but you're really doing therapy on yourself where you're like, who am I? Like at my core, who is Danny Jollis? And that was like a big part of it, of like discovering that. And then I, so everybody has a different way of dealing with a bomb. My way is I am very honest about it. And even in the special, because I taped this in a way where usually the way you tape a special is you rent out a theater, you invite all your friends, family, fans like everybody that knows you into a theater so it's this stacked crowd and you crush i did it where i did six random shows where nobody knew who i was or that i even was taping a special hmm. and so as a result you hear multiple times during a special i'm fighting with the crowd so you kind of see like at points i miss a little and then i go come here because i i'll talk i i'll talk to them and i'll get them back on board that's what i do now like now I'm very good at like parts miss. I move things around, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll pull the rip cord on a joke, like just halfway through. I'm like, we got it. We're out of here. Like, let's move on. Um, I do that all the time, but it's, it's just communication with the crowd, but that's taking, yeah. that takes years to get to that amount of comfort level for years. All I did was I would just miss jokes and I would just get sad on stage. Yeah. And you know, that's, and I found one very interesting element in your in your in your stand up that I found very it was very unique. So whenever like even with that uh, professional wrestling joke, uh, you know, you had you were you know describing how different people you know visualized. Uh, oh, sorry, the firework joke. My apologies. The, you, you were describing you know the America America how you know Michael Jackson's doing the moonwalk and everything. There's so uh, you noticed how people uh, were laughing and there was this other minority in the audience who wasn't. And, you know, it, it's something that I noticed like maybe on maybe a little one to two or three occasions where you, you know, you told them, you know, learn from them, visualize it, uh, visual thinking, mm -hmm. visual learners, you know, and yeah, yeah. that is like, that was, I was thinking that's a banger response because you know, you're making a joke about the fact that they're not laughing and getting the people who aren't laughing to join into the joke. And you're instantly making the people who are already laughing at this original joke better about themselves. And you're mm -hmm. grasping the people who didn't have your attention's attention and the people who already did's attention even more. And, you know, it, as you said, it speaks volumes of where experience takes you. Now, 
you even spoke about how different uh, you need different journeys for each of your jokes you need different journeys for each of your productions which mm-hmm. makes me wonder when it came to this six part special you spoke about how you had these random uh, random audiences just left right and center you know i'm doing this join in and they just walk in so when you picked these six different sets so for the viewers who haven't seen this yet who should uh danny's uh, special had six different parts which was conducted because it was six different pieces and he had six different sets when you were choosing the, was there a specific reasoning behind why you chose those particular sets you know they were themed around a particular reasoning was it random was there a reason what was it it was it was just kind of random honestly so i did it with this company called don't tell comedy and that's their whole business model their whole business model is pick a random is we do any place but a comedy club pick a random spot we set up chairs we turn on lights comedy can happen there and i fell in love with the company from the beginning because i was like i came up in really really uh shitty rooms in new york and particularly bar shows which like i did a ton of which is where you learn bar shows is all about there's 20 people in the room and only two people are paying attention to the comedy. And so you reward the two and then maybe a third guy listens in and you get him and then four and you literally are bringing people into the show. It's like that instinct. And so when we did this, we just picked six random places and we had I mean this is I cannot stress this enough to anybody out there getting into stand-up comedy. Do not do a special the way I did a special. This is the dumbest way to do a special. It, it was so hard. Um, we basically had like two hours at every place before the crowd showed up to set up an entire set. We had no budget. We had no ability to like. I mean, it was just so hard, and we just kept going. Like the whole thing was, we we had six shows, and we were like, <laughs> we literally kept going, going like, all right, it'll be called five parts. <laughs> like just every show would be like, if this one doesn't work, we'll just cut it and we'll just figure it out. and then it just it kept working it we no we thought we were going to we were like every like a art gallery the art gallery part yeah yeah only 20 people showed up to that mm-hmm. show so we were like all right well this will never work like <laughs> we're out of here like all right we'll do the show you know these people came but like yeah and then ooh my my ooh, microphone my, yeah yeah What's I don't the... like that. Let's see what happens here. Oh, because it slid out because I got too excited, and that's what you get. That's <laughs> what you get when you get too. My own fault. There we go. All right, we're back. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're, back. we're back. Yeah. Pod, pod, podcast listeners are gonna love that moment. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. Um, so we're like only 20 people. So we're like, oh, we're never gonna use this, but we'll just do it. And then they were the best 20. they were just the best audience members and it was like i remember finishing we were like all right i guess we're going to f- use that part that's like i think that's going to go in and it was like every show was like that was just like what's the problem with this one why won't yeah. it work and then somehow it working it was really remarkable but it was it, it was just us hanging on for dear life and it was literally what was available we had two weekends to film this so we had, yeah. you know that we could rent the equipment. So it was it was just what was available and pray praying they would work out. And they did. It was wild. Wild, wild. It's amazing and you know, it makes me wonder again going back to your experience in the industry, right? You've been at it for about a decade if less give or take a few years and you know, it it yeah. I and you know i wonder because you know you spoke i was watching this other interviews of you of yours as well where you as you said now you spoke about the the different you know how you get brain fucked by you know these uh, different failures you have and you get demoralized absolute you know your your the very thing that you want to get into you know, of being funny and when you realize you're not funny at the very basic fundamental of it you've failed and you know there's there's still a part of you that still has to keep that lamp burning to tell you that you know you still have to keep going forward so was there any 
but when when it came to this or when it came to any other one of your stand ups after which you were demoralized in that manner did you feel just have to say that you know fuck it i want to do more of this why the fuck not like thought about quitting you mean uh yeah quitting like yeah like i mean particularly early on you think about quitting hourly i mean it's just like It, uh, the early years of stand up comedy like i'm very much a believer in like the experience you had is great and i encourage people to like i, I think everybody should try it once or twice like it's fun to do but when i talk to somebody who's like i'm thinking about doing stand up comedy i'm like look you're going to have to if you want if you really want to do this thing you're going to have to every single night for years and years and years you're going to have to bomb on stage and you're going to have to go up two to three times a night and it's not going to go well it's going to be mostly open mics with other comics who don't care and that's going to be your life hmm. so if you want that the other side of those years is really like the part i'm at now still hard like i'm still battling but now i have this foundation of how what i know what i'm doing and it's you know you get opportunities and cool but those first couple of years are just so brutal i i do not encourage it on any like young person i talk to i'm like if you really want to do it do it you know it's one of the fairest industries you can get into as far as like you know if you get really good if you work hard and you get really good it's kind of like mma if you get really good at mma you'll make money in mma but you got to get really really good and you're going to yeah. have to work really really hard yeah. those first couple of years man i thought about quitting so much it was horrible terrible time yeah because you know i was having a discussion with my brother about this recently about you know how there are like these few fields where you know you have to just be really good or get out and mm -hmm. we concluded that stand up comedy was a part of them and you know mixed martial arts was a part of this because you know how do you know that you're not a good mixed martial artist you get knocked out you lose your decision and what not mm -hmm. and how do you know you're not a good stand up comedian no one laughs at your joke when you lose and, and, yeah and it's very similar in a sense of you think you're good like i remember early on like there's one show in particular i always will think back on where like it was early i was probably like 2 to 3 years in so still a baby but i was starting to get like decent it was starting to like get a little bit better and i was on this big show and i had industry come to see me it's probably one of the first shows i ever had where industry was like coming to see me and it was me and this other comic i'd never heard of before she had just moved to town from san francisco apparently she'd been doing it for years never heard of her i go up i thought i had a pretty good set and then the comic after me was ali wong and she decimated me just on another planet of talent and skill and and years you just saw that she'd been doing it for a decade longer than me yeah. and it was obvious and i just remember being like it was like getting knocked out it was like oh okay that's what that so i'm not as good as i thought and that's what real work does and let's get back to work but like you have to have that as a stand up you just are on shows with people all the time you're on shows with you know comics who you're like oh they just beat me so they just did so much better you yeah. know laughs are very obvious it's obvious when somebody kills harder than you it's very yeah. clear yeah exactly oh. like it 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 goes the same way for something like like mma as well you know you know when you're being outboxed so you know you when you're being punished mm -hmm. more than the other guy and you know which you know except the actual physical hurt that comes off of it at the mm -hmm. very ending of of the performance uh you know one thing that stays in common is the mental aspect of it because let's say when a guy when a guy or a girl you know you lose let's say you lose a match you know you're demoralized because you're thinking shit this person is significantly better than me and i was physically dominated by this person and this person has is superior to me you know similarly for like your example you were you you walked in to the stage and you thought she did well and suddenly there's this other person who suddenly has this better weight and out did you and you know there was that little inferiority complex sort of thing this person that great this person. 
Yeah, it's not, it's not even inferiority complex. It was genuinely better. I was like, she was <laughs> better. She's a better comedian than me at this stage in our life. And that's the only thing you can say is go. And Ali Wong is still a better comedian than me. I would say very, very honestly, but I continue to get better and she continues yeah. to get better somehow. I did a show <laughs> with her a couple weeks ago. She like is still just like, you know, literally being this thing and being like great jokes out. Like she's so good. She's so good at what she does. Are you, are you um, close to We're friendly. We're not like close, close, but it's just like, but I, you know, we're, she's a lovely human. She's a, just an incredibly lovely human who's really good at stand up comedy and it shows. And yeah. that's also the nice thing about stand up. And I think MMA, which is sometimes you get beat by somebody, but it's like you don't, if you're good, if you're going to make it in stand up, another part of it is you have to get used to the idea that you're not the funniest human to ever exist. <laughs> like, there are people who are funnier than you, and there are people who are going to have better sets than you. And that's a regular thing, and you can't get mad at them. There's comics all the time I see who like get really upset when like someone does like, oh, well, it's just because they're hat and it's like it's just had a better set than you, man. Like it happens. You gotta <laughs> just it's all right. Like I remember like that night with Ali was like, and I remember industry swarmed her, and it was like, Yeah, she was better. They should, they should swarm her. She's a better comedian than me right now. I'll work, keep working hard and good for her. Like root for, you should always be rooting for others Yeah. because it's, it's only going to make you better to be surrounded by people who are really good. Did that night, did anyone from the industry approach you? Did they tell you anything like good job or a pat on the back? I mean, they said nice things, but it was like year. I was years away from getting signed and right. I knew it like still it was, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard to get noticed by industry. You know, there's a lot of pe there's a lot of talent. Well, there's we discussed, you know, people laughing at the jokes. We discussed people not laughing at the jokes. But with stand up, there's another element to it. When people are discuss when people are bringing out their jokes, when they have, let's say, something to do with race or something to do with religion or something to do with any political sentiment and whatnot, there will always be some form of backlash from some person in society where who hasn't realized that it's just a joke. And I was wondering that among multiple stand-up comedians who've faced, you know, a lot of backlash, uh, you know, there's people who've been kicked out of the set mid-show for saying what they said. Have you ever faced any form of actual backlash where a dude comes up to you like, what the fuck, Danny? You're not allowed to say that shit. Fuck you. I've never gotten a, that hard. I definitely, look, I'm personally somebody who believes I'm saying opinions to a crowd of people. A yeah. lot of opinions. Like, and pretty strong opinions. <laughs> and on top of that, and let me say this, I don't say anything on stage I don't believe. That's one of my rules. So, and that's not a thing every comic does. That's just my thing. So it's like, my thing is always like, if someone comes to me afterwards and they're like, they're like, what you said was wrong. I'm like, oh, I really genuinely, I never reply with like, it was a joke. I'm always like, no, that's, no, that's what I believe. Like, we can discuss mm -hmm. it. But also I think, look, people are allowed to be offended. I think it's a good thing. And it's also, it's also a lot of times, it's also people throw in the word offended. And it's like, sometimes people just disagree or they don't like you. And that's okay. Like, I, I do think there's this wild idea that you can be a, you can publicly put hours of opinions out and think that every human is supposed to love it. It's like, it's okay. I, I, I don't know. I never have had gotten that upset by it. Anytime somebody's been, you know, all the time, every time I got, I got a special on YouTube. There's some people who don't like it, you know, and there's going to be people who say, who comment being like, oh, it's stupid or this is bad or whatever. And it's like, yeah, that's their opinion. They're allowed to not like it. I don't, I don't get the upset that some yeah. people get about that where they're like, how dare you? How dare you not agree? Nobody really does that. And as far as like offended goes, I did colleges for forever and still do them. I'll do college gigs, which yeah. is like supposedly the, the true like nightmare place. I, look, I go on stage and I say like everything I say up here, I'm going to, I believe is true. And if you disagree with me, come up to me after the show and we'll discuss it. Mm -hmm. I have like no issues. How often? I'm respectful. Yeah. How often have you had the discussions? 
every now and then somebody's like, I didn't agree with this. And I'm like, all right, well, tell me what you believe. It's just a discussion, you know, and, and they respect it. And it's, it's the defensiveness that, that gets people upset too. Right. It's like you say an opinion, then they say an opinion back to you of like, I don't agree with that. And then you go, how dare you? And it's like, they said their opinion. You say your opinion. You know, like I, to me, I'd rather engage with the difference in opinions because there's also jokes of mine for the record where I've said it a certain way. Somebody came up to me and was like, I don't agree with that. I've been like, why? They've made a really good point. And I've changed the joke to like reflect that. I've been like, oh, that's a fair criticism of the joke. And I've let it ma- and it's made the joke better. Mm-hmm. So it's like, that's a part of it. I, I think the only thing I, the only thing that gets me upset is going back to old jokes or old premises or potentially like a half formed thought on a podcast from t- 10 years ago. When that happens to a comic, that's the only thing that upsets me. Cause I'm like, you know, that's, I think it's one thing to judge somebody for who they are now. I think it's another thing for particularly opinion stuff where it isn't like a physical thing from 10 years ago. I think that's, that's a little tough, but I also get that. But also again, people are allowed to not like you. That's okay. Yeah. So that's that's my that's my long rant on that. But <laughs> I mean, yeah, people is. are allowed to not like you. It's okay. Yeah. I, I mean, know. it's good that people not like you because that's another group of people who you know can tell you you're wrong and tell you you know check yourself. Yeah. And and again, sometimes they're very right. Sometimes yeah. they're like multiple times with jokes. Someone's been like, "That is not true," and I've been like, "Yeah, it is," and then they've been like. They've I've talked, I've engaged genuinely and truly part of it's engaging, honestly, you know, being like, talk to me, tell me what you disagree with and really having them talk to me and be like, "Eh, fair (laughs) point. Like, I didn't think about it that way. Like, all right. And I changed the joke. Yeah, because I think that's an important part of learning that's lost in transit, especially when it comes to stand up comedy, because Usually when someone, I, I mean, at least from what I've heard on these different podcasts that I've watched and, and whatnot, is that people have often shared stories about how some guy walked up to them and told them, you know, you're a shit guy. I hate you. I hate you. I hate everything you stand for. You, you're the wrong here. You're wrong there. And, you know, why I hate you, I cannot convey. I just hate you. And I leave it at that. And the, the guy walks away and no one's learned anything. It's just a mutual hatred that's mm-hmm. been created. And, you know, some, as you mentioned, someone came up to you, told you that, you know, this is why you're wrong. That's a fair point. I made my joke better. It hits better with the crowd as well. So uh, tell me, c- correct me if I'm wrong here, but do you, um, I think that an important part, an element of the improvement of a comic stand up of a comics piece or a joke or the way they articulate is lost. Um, you know, the scope for development is lost when the critique cannot uh, critique, whether it be, you know, a friend, a family member, an actual critic who's here to, you know, watch and comment on your, on your work has told you something and, it's not received well because they just think you're here to mess with their spirit and demoralize them because that's an, an often made as often an assumption made about them. And it just, and the criticism is just taken as no, you're wrong. And I will never change this because you're wrong. And you know, how do you, do you think that that's something that's impacted multiple comics unknowingly? I think that, look, there's people out there who just don't like you and there's no real constructive criticism coming your way, right? There's people who don't like me. There's people who won't like my comedy because I'm Jewish. There's no constructive criticism there. There's nothing that's going to be said that's going to be helpful. It's just like, don't like you because who you are. And it's like, yeah, sure, that's fair, you know? But when somebody comes in and they give you a fair criticism, I think it's, you know, I think early in comedy, there are comedy circles where they're like, you say whatever you want, there are no rules. And, uh, and look, I respect that, but I don't, ed- I personally think like if I'm saying something into a microphone on stage, I, sh- yeah, I should be held responsible for those words. That seems fair. I made people pay money to hear me say them. Yeah. Like if you have a genuine criticism, 
not just is it fair, I encourage it. I want it. I want to be, because guess what? I might end up being a better person at the end of it. Also, by the way, forgetting comedy, I might know a thing about a group I didn't understand and maybe like understand, you know, and, and realize I don't get something. And, and now I'm, now I understand that group better. It's like, mm -hmm. God forbid I get, I, I actually improve as a human. It's like, there's good things that can come from these things. So I'm a big believer in like, listen, you know, li listen to the criticism. Criticism is good. Yeah. It's okay. And, you know, let's shift gears for a second here and move on to something I've heard you talk about, which is basketball. I heard you on the stand up as well. I mean, I have one question. Washington Wizards, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, for <laughs> life. Wiz kid for life, baby. And uh, they're terrible. They're a bad team. Uh, we're never going to win. But I'll. But you, I mean, I've been born into this. Who's your team? Uh, my team? Yeah. Uh, the Lakers. I've been, uh, the Lakers. Lakers. There you go. Yeah. All day, Lakers, every day. Yeah. So that's fun. That's fun. So, yeah, yeah. We, we, I'm a DC sports fan across the board. So, Nationals, Wizards, Capitals, football team. Yeah. And, uh, and it's tough. It's not been a fun ride. We've gotten a couple. The Capitals got me one. Nationals got me championship. But for the most part, it's been tough. The Wizards are a franchise that is just down and out but I'll never quit on my team. <laughs> Love them. Love them. And I wish they would pay attention to me. I said this on so many podcasts. I'm like, they have no, you know, I'm not the most famous person on earth, but I think as wizards fans go, I may be the most outspoken. <laughs> and I don't know why they never, they never ask me to do anything. I'm always like wizards. I'm repping you guys. The only person out here repping you. Fair enough. I mean, I was about to come up here and give you a little bit of criticism and tell you, you know what? You're a Wizards fan. Shame on you. Come join the Lakers. No, man. And, and no, you yeah. gotta, you gotta stay loyal. Can't <laughs> quit on your teams. You can say anything to me about the Wizards. I'll, I'm first off, it's probably true. And secondly, <laughs> <laughs> we're a terrible franchise. We, but we have a lot of good fun. We, we have a good foundation right now. If Thomas Bryant didn't tear his ACL, we would be having a tremendous season. I really do believe that. I mean, um, terrible, less bad. That's how I describe it. <laughs> I think we'd be an eight, seven seed. I think we'd make the playoffs, which is exciting to me. This is, and this is truly like the DC sports, like beaten down that I've gotten it to. Cause like, this is how, but I'm always like, if, if my team makes the playoff, I consider it a success. That season <laughs> is good for me. The football team this year was a disastrous season. Uh, horrible. Well, we made the playoffs. We backed our way into the playoffs and I was like, win what a win of a year i loved it <laughs> i mean i yeah. got i don't watch much football but i got into football i watched a little bit of it ever since i saw that one patrick that one famous mahomes play you know they oh, ran man. that wasp play and they yeah we like I, I noticed how they did that and that's when i like i, I got intrigued by it and you know, I, I mean, I'm, I play a bit of rugby here and there. And then I saw like that bit come into uh, NFL and I, I was watching, I'm very intrigued by it. And that's when I started watching a little bit. And yeah, you're, I mean, one thing I do admire about you at this point is sticking to your guns, you know, even though you may have the smallest gun or the weakest gun or a gun that doesn't work, <laughs> you still stick to it. <laughs> of course, you can't quit on your teams. You got to stick by them. You know, and it's okay. And it's look, they're bad. A lot of my teams are bad. They struggle, but I'll never quit. I'll always be a DC sports fan for life. <laughs> I mean, the other than other than basketball, uh, other than the few Washington Wizards, uh, Washington teams out there in sports, mm -hmm. um, you do you uh, you do you follow any other individual sports or anything uh, other than that? Of course, I know you follow professional wrestling, but uh, the mix. So I follow arts. professional wrestling. I watch. I watch UFC. Yeah. Um, big, um, big contender series fan. That's oh. my, that's their, that's my favorite program of theirs. Mm -hmm. I wish more people talked about it. I wish they did a, I have a lot, I have a lot of, I think it is, could be so much better than it is, but I love the contender series. I love the prelims. Mm. That's my favorite part of the UFC card. Yeah, I love the guys. True. I love the guys who it's like, they got three fights to get, get a real contract. Cause you get, cause you get put in the UFC with a three fight contract usually, and they're battling to get that second contract. 
and they are it is life or death for those guys and i mm. love that i i find that so exciting i love ufc i'm a mm. big ufc guy um to a lesser extent the rest of them because i just there's only so much time in the day but i um <laughs> you know between between wwe and AEW, just absolutely putting out so much content and then ufc now doing a fight card a week you yeah know, i, I mean i was point. very i was very uh confused i mean i don't know what you thought about it but the whole this whole new concept of you know putting fans on these little led screens in the back you know and putting in these fake audio clips in there I mean, the fake audio clips, I agree with, but I don't know. The fans on these little... See, I actually screens. hate the fake audio clips. The, ar- the audio clips I hate. I, that's the one thing I really don't like what they're doing. I Look, don't like it, but I understand it. I do understand it, too. Look, at the end of the day, as somebody who watched Hollywood grind to a halt when <laughs> COVID hit, right? Like, for probably six months, Hollywood was like, how can we do anything? How can we film anything? How can we do anything? The next week, they were like, there's no crowd here. We're all getting tested. We're going to figure this thing out. And they just did. And AEW went to an outdoor stadium. And they got crowd the crowd way back there. But it was just, and they moved the wrestlers around brilliantly. Any wrestler that wasn't in the match around the ring. So it felt like there was a crowd. So smart. And then WWE, you watch NXT, and they have that where they have like this small audience, and it feels great. Yeah. And then when you watch Raw, and I'm like, I agree, the LED screens. I'm like, why you? The NXT thing feels so good. Do what NXT yeah. is doing. Yeah, I mean, I it was very interesting. It. They adopted. Uh, I don't know why they didn't carry on with it, but they adopted the strategy where they it was released that some of these people who are being asked to stand in the stand stand in the stands are uh, actually WWE contracted. Uh, some of these guys yeah. are like some like low level guys who haven't been heard of or, uh, you know, just people wearing masks and whatnot, just standing yeah. on the sides. And it's it's a really smart strategy. And I don't understand why they wouldn't do more of it because I'm sure they, they could have brought out some guy from the cafeteria. They could have brought out people left, right and center to just stand there and cheer when they were yeah, they're being tested cheer. anyway. Because it's all about being tested, right? And then yeah. AEW, they've been, I mean, like, they've been doing stuff where people are going flying into that crowd. You know, you can do some crazy shit because you can go off the top rope into the crowd, which normally you can't do because it's yeah. me. And I'm I'm not, I don't, I don't want you falling. You know, I like wrestling, but I don't want, I don't need you falling on me. <laughs> like, but, but now it's actual, like, you know, the wrestlers who aren't f- competing sitting yeah. in the front so you can fall on them so you can go i mean some of the you know you can go flying into that crowd yeah like scope for creativity so, yeah yeah i love i've loved the creativity i've seen from professional wrestling during this mm. and the nba by the way the bubble yeah. was one of the most fun experiences as a sports fan i've never had more fun than the bubble yeah it was the most unique i mean mm-hmm. when the nba brought about this whole concept of the bubble i was very intrigued and it was it was I mean, I kind of liked it. And then eventually they start putting in the LED screens and I didn't really like the LED screens. And, you know, even when the UFC, the UFC was very, uh, mm-hmm. um, the UFC had these, didn't have, didn't have much changes. It was just this silent arena. You could hear the shots yeah. echoing. You could hear the corner. I screen. loved it. Yeah. It I was... thought it was so cool. I loved the, I loved getting to hear the shots in UFC. I thought it was so interesting to hear that i never want to hear it again the second we can have a crowd great like yeah. please don't ever let me do it but man for a year to really i mean some of those kicks you would hear you'd just be like goodness gracious that was you, were you able to watch the jan blahovich versus dominic reyes fight yes yeah yes, so yeah it, yeah so the polish guy who uh mm-hmm. the, the guy who fought john jones yeah so when they they fought i mean I mean, if it, I mean, I've often drawn this comparison, but when he was kicking Reyes on uh, the uh, in the on the body, his 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 side was just bruising, uh, like it was going crazy, like over the course of the round, and you know, it almost looked as if his body was turning purple. It was like being snapped off by Thanos. Brutal. Yeah, and brutal. It was so brutal to watch. I agree. Yeah, exactly, and. 
but it made me uh, as gross as as much of a gross as gross as it may sound but i kind of liked it because it made me appreciate what these guys do even more because to be able I, to yeah yeah no i totally agree i think that's been the cool part of this past year with ufc and again the second we don't have to do this anymore for the love of god i never want to do it again like yeah, i want a crowd week, in there next week or the week after fans I know, are back. They're doing something f- I know they're doing Florida full room. Yeah, seems a 17, little early, but seventeen thousand people. Seems a little soon, but I guess we're doing it. But yeah. I, uh, <laughs> yes, if you ask me, it feels like we could have started with five thousand, but here we are. Um, but look, they, they, but also, you know, for what it's worth, and I said this about about UFC early was UFC, you know, said, hey, we're doing fights. Yeah, and there was a lot of criticism of them. And Dana White said, we're going to test. We're going to do the things. You know, we're following the rules. And there were some people out there who were like, again, Hollywood took a long time to get going. It was just this fear. And watching UFC be like, we're going to test. We're going to be as careful as we can be. And they did it. 17,000 scares me. I don't like that number. That does make me anxious. But it's going to feel awesome as a spectator. It's going to be awesome to watch on TV to hear the the audience again. But I am glad that we're we're going to forever have these fights that we can listen to where you can hear a kick and be like man i know that you can hear a kick when there's a full crowd but not like we heard for this past year well i've never heard particularly kicks yeah. kicks were brutal and the way people would hit the mat sometimes like you and the the yeah. the like the corners like you're just hearing everything the corner's saying which was yeah. so exciting the, i i, I thought it was so it. fun yeah because yeah you know and to the to the point about hollywood it didn't just stop the people who did try to go on with it messed it up because I mean I don't really watch it was so hard. Yeah, it was I'm, so hard. I, I like yeah. watching like a few television series. Uh, you know, I watch a few movies once in a while. Maybe like the Marvel movies when they come out. Something by maybe a uh, DiCaprio when he releases something. A few, a few things. You know, and sure. um, one of the few shows that I watch, Blacklist, right? I watched, I've been watching it for a while. I binged the entire thing in a month and the next season, the the most recent season was coming out and the, the season finale, right? They weren't able to get that out because of COVID. And they said, you know what? We just did it. We got it done and you're going to love it. So as it turned out, what they did was uh, they already had a few pre-recorded scenes, right? And they didn't record many of the other scenes. Right before COVID hit, yeah. And guess what they did? They put these really shitty animations to transition in between. Right. And I remember this. They had them do these little voiceovers, and some of these guys didn't really have access to the production level mics, and it sounded as if they were doing it in their bedrooms. And oh my god, it was it so was wild. I mean, the bad. early days were so tough. It was so wild that those early days in the Look, I lost so much work due to COVID. Yeah, and which is what I wanted it, to ask it, you about. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we lost, I lost so much work. So much. But it was tough, man. It was, and it was tough because you look, you understand it. It's a huge, we have, look, the, the beauty of Hollywood, and this is something UFC at some point is going to have to deal with, which is we have unions here. And unions are really important because they keep actors safe. And unfortunately, this was a situation where this was a disease where you're not supposed to be in close contact with somebody else. And the only way to act is to be in close contact with other humans. It's the only way to do what we do. And stand up, obviously, a whole nother nightmare. But even like, but acting was like brutal. So it was really hard. And the unions were scared and protecting us. Mm-hmm. And producers were scared because they don't want to get sued. And it was so it took a long time legally, whereas the UFC was like, you either fight or you don't. And they don't really have a union, right? UFC doesn't have any unions for the, for yeah, the yeah. athletes, which is a yeah. problem. Yeah. At some point, they're going to have to have a union. No, but, so, but guess what? They, they're not just they don't really have these unions because these guys have social media following like no other. Like you, a lawyer, UFC fan is lawyer. I mean, uh, because. There was this Jorge Masvidal, 
he uh mm-hmm. he uh, the basically Kamaru Usman was love in a Mas- fight love Masvidal. yeah he was I, yeah I liked Masvidal he's lost me late recently because of the whole Jake Paul bullshit uh yeah yeah it's like what I are you really doing yeah because yeah. <laughs> what happened there was I, I I like how we got into that Jake Paul hate this <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's the quick little. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> I like. So basically, it was interesting how he was supposed to fight Gilbert Burns, Usman. Uh, I think uh, Gilbert got COVID or he had to pull out for an injury or something of sorts. I don't really remember. And uh, it was like very short notice, like a week, about a week or less. And uh, mm-hmm. the main reason why Masvidal, who was originally supposed to take that fight before Gilbert, didn't take it because the money wasn't right. He said, mm-hmm. he promoted this on social media. He said, you know, you pay me right, I'm in. The UFC bumped up his pay by, from what he says, about 1.5 uh, of times what he was being paid last time around. And it was mm-hmm. more than, and he was being paid seven figures already. And that's at least from what he says. And that increased. And he just said, you know, stick to your guns. You're going to get paid. And then it makes you wonder uh, how, you know, all these people have these different followings and they can get that way with their, their, because they work for the UFC at the end of the day. And many of these actors, when they're going from uh, movie to movie uh, or from, or from series to another movie and whatnot, they're going to be working for different production companies and it's different contracts and whatnot. So when you're negotiating that stuff, it, it's going to be a lot trickier, I would assume. Well, it's, but keep in mind, right? It's like the reason a union exists in theory, and I use in theory because I have seen unions go all directions on this thing. But in theory, a union exists not to protect Masvidal, but to protect the lowest level fighter, right? Masvidal is going to get paid. He's their biggest draw at the moment. He might be their biggest draw at the moment. I mean, he's huge. The Askren knockout is one of the most like, show-stopping knockouts of the past five years like just you know he's huge he's got this great backstory of like you just look him up fighting in backyards he's got so masvidal is gonna get paid yeah the problem is the prelim guys are yeah. they getting paid a fair amount because they can't negotiate their negotiation is you take this money or you don't find the ufc and yeah, that stinks for them it's kind of sad for them because you know, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether to believe it or not, but it was very convincing to me when I first heard it. So there's, I mean, you if you've watched some of these phenomenal knockouts, you've seen that guy, Joaquin Buckley, uh, that's mm-hmm. crazy spinning back kick, right? Incredible. Yeah. Saw it live. Yeah, exactly. So keep that in mind, right? So essentially, he got that little highlight and mm-hmm. he fought another guy and he didn't fight, he didn't fight any ranked guy. And uh, so he just kept fighting. He fought this other guy, knocked him out. It was another big highlight for him. He got paid. Everyone's on the Buckley hype train. So the theory is, is that the UFC was now going to give him another scrub, scrub to fight. Uh, and, you know, for him to get another highlight and get back and go fight a ranked guy with a lot of hype behind his name, get viewership, get paid, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. So he uh-huh. fought this guy. Alessio de Quirico. He was coming off a three fight skid, three which was zero and three in the UFC. I think zero and three, or maybe one win early on. I'm not too sure. But anyway, I he saw was this a, fight. Yeah, three or four fights kid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he was on this fight skid. He was supposed to get knocked out and released. Uh, and note that this guy was being slapped on for quite some time, Quirico. And he no one interviewed him after he lost. He made a big deal about it. Uh, keep that in mind, right? And he comes in to fight Buckley. He styles on Buckley, knocks him out. Cool. He's stiff as a board. And, you know, he he makes a highlight out of the highlight maker uh, mm-hmm. at the time. And, you know, goes to say that, you know, you know what? I'm not, I have, I'm not being treated fairly. I'm supposed to be interviewed this and that. He was asked to go for a post-fight presser. He said, no, you're supposed to interview the guy who lost as well. And he walked out and, you know, it was a, there was a huge deal made out of it. Uh, it's boy, it's come down ever since, but it makes you wonder how these people are not just used, but are 
you know used in a way in which it's going to be detrimental to their literal life because if you're being put a uh, why was alessio put up against waqueen to make waqueen look good by doing what hurting alessio and that would yeah. eventually just be detrimental to alessio of course granted alessio signed up for it but you know it's kind of weird to have someone come in just to be knocked out yeah no it's a, it's a it's a problem there and it's look it speaks to the beauty of fighting in UFC in a sense of and even like you know stand up like one of my favorite things once i got pretty good at stand up one of my favorite things was being on a show with a big name hyped person who everybody was there to you know very famous young particularly like back in the day man we had this no even now i mean we have like viners and tiktokers and these guys who kind of don't really do stand up but they you know get these huge showcase shows and everybody's there to watch them like launch their massive career mm. but they don't know what they're doing and i and i take great pride and find great joy yeah. in burying them with my jokes like i'm going to do a better job because i've been doing this longer they know how to make tiktoks i know how to do stand up comedy you know i wouldn't enter their world but they decided to enter mine <laughs> and I've gotten so many of my opportunities in my career off of people came to the same thing that happened to me early on. Ali Wong beat me. It's like sometimes I show up and I'm like, yeah, you, you guys all came to see this. You because, came here to see this TikToker, yeah, but yeah. you're going to you're going to leave talking about me. <laughs> yeah, because that's and yeah, yeah, yeah. So and so that was the beauty of that fight, right, was this guy who was supposed to be the guy who was just supposed to be a beat up. But it's not, you know, the thing I like at UFC is like, and it happened at Buckley where they were like, you can't look past your opponent. You got to, you got to focus on what was there. He, you know, he clearly was thinking about that next big fight. Didn't take right. this guy seriously. Got knocked out. Also got caught. I mean, he like should have won that fight. Yeah. It seemed like Buckley was going to win and he just got caught, which is, yeah. that does not happen in stand. Well, that does happen in stand up. Sometimes you just like misspeak on stage. Yeah. yeah. Or you like, you just, I mean, I've had so many shows where, like, just the wrong en- – I came out with the wrong energy for whatever reason. Like, crowd didn't want it that way, and I should have seen that. Because you, you're always changing up your – not personality, but you're changing it up based on the crowd, right? You're always trying to, like, meet them at what they want and then do your thing and bring them to your world. And sometimes you don't – sometimes, like, there's so many sets that go back. You know, it's still to this day. Like, I don't bomb like I used to bomb. But, you know, your bomb level changes. So it's like I used to bomb like straight up bomb. Now I bomb like it's a, it was OK. That's like a bomb for me. It's like it shouldn't be. OK. It, you know, I'm I'm past that. But like a lot of times when I listen back, I'm like, it's my fault. Like came out the wrong energy. I was I wasn't focused. I missed a part of a joke. Sometimes I miss, you know, it's like, you know, it's you got to be critical of yourself. So that's what happened to Buckley there. I, I thought it was, look, it's good for the fight. It's the same thing that happened with that. Uh, oh, what's the name of the, the bigger boxer who beat uh, who beat Joshua? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Andy Ruiz? Yeah, Ruiz. Yeah. That fight, right? It was supposed to be a, he was supposed to just get beat up by a big guy, and he caught him. You know, it's the beauty of the fight game. Yeah. So I like those moments. It's, it's a good moment, but I hear you. No, and it's, and it's scary, and the thing is like, – the thing with that guy is like getting released from his contract, right? That sucks. That stinks. Yeah. And and these it's are the tough. Same- it's tough for these fighters. Yeah, and these are the the same prelim level guys we've spoken about because these are the guys who are literally backed up in a corner. I mean, mm-hmm. imagine getting through the contender series, and even for a guy like Alessio, you're on a ter- terrible situation with regards to your contract because you've been losing for a while, and mm-hmm. you have to perform well. Otherwise, you're not going to carry on making your bread and butter in that in that same company. And, you know, yeah. these are the guys who have everything to lose because many of the big guys, they already have the cash. And even if they do lose, they'll still get paid. Yeah. So it's... Yeah. Miles Fidal could lose three fights in a row. He'll still be... Here. Conor McGregor loses constantly now. It's He's still Conor McGregor. <laughs> yeah, there you he's go. Gonna make, he's he's got to make money. <laughs> yeah, they're going to pay him. And of course they will, because guess what? He draws. Everybody's yeah. going to I'll watch Dix McGregor. I'll watch every McGregor fight. I don't like, I don't even like him. I just watch because he's interesting and he's famous. And yeah. I hate that about myself, but I'm weak. And I <laughs> give in. Don't worry. That's the same with me and this whole Jake Paul, Ben Askren situation. 
I mean, I know, I know. I'm gonna watch it too. I hate it. It's so weird. It's so weird. I'm, I'm, and for some reason, I. It is. Yeah. It is very funny to me that boxing is doing having the same problem stand up comedy is having, (laughs) where like TikTokers are just taking over our industry. Yeah, there's like it's like YouTubers versus TikTokers a boxing event coming up as well, and it's 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 horrible. It blows my mind because and and it's horrible. Yeah, because it's it's almost as if boxing's admitting that you know we're done. We give in. You're bringing me the attention. But it's not that. It's well. Here's what it is. Like, where where do you live? Uh, I live in India. You live in India. Yeah. Very cool. I was like, I was like, I was about to be like, look at your local comedy club. But even your local comedy club, I would imagine. Um, but if you look at like comedy clubs here in particular, maybe it's not. Eh, I wonder. Check it out. See if it's the same problem there. But yeah. like, if you look at if you look at comedy clubs here, there are Tuesday, Wednesday shows, sometimes weekend shows that are going to, you know, TikTokers and YouTubers and people who do do not do stand up comedy. Who are in stand-up comedy clubs, doing the art form I've put my entire life towards, and they are getting, and they will because they'll fill it. They'll just fill the room, and it's the same problem. And and you go, but don't we care about the art? And the comedy club goes, and more than fairly, I get it, is like they're gonna fill. You know, we'll make so much money off of this room being filled. It's the same problem boxing's having. Where these guys aren't good, but Jake Paul is going to draw, and the guy who's a re- the the fifth ranked middleweight isn't. He's just <laughs> not going to draw a massive like, you know. And it's like it's just interesting. They're having it's just the draw problem. It's we are both have industries where draw matters a lot, and boxing. These YouTubers, I'm hoping they leave stand up alone and they go to boxing now because yeah. you know let them deal with this problem. But it is it is a problem. Yeah. And you know, it's it's kind of interesting that and you know what? Hold up. I'm taking a little pause here. I have a question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You 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 entered and you've been holding your mic still straight up the same way. Your hands been the same way this entire time. Does your arm not hurt? <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. All I do is hold microphones. This what? this oh, muscle, really? whatever muscles here that holds a microphone, yeah. that's all I do. I, I yeah, sh- I got a mic stand over here, but I don't use. Don't it. use it. I never. I'm gonna try this for a little bit because I I, do, I usually just keep the stand here. I'm gonna try doing this for a little bit because you know what? I'm I'm really intrigued because a lot of these people just keep it there for a while, and I'm like, bro, does does your, does your arm not hurt? Nah, it's all I do. All That's I do is hold microphones right. like this all day long. And you know, all I do. Speaking speaking of and. It's not speaking of, but I, it occurred to me once again. But I was going through some of your old, some of the older clips on your YouTube channel, and I came across the one where the one about the black sandwich, the the one about the girlfriend mm-hmm. looking better and everything. I mean, uh, my personal favorite. And uh, you know, you. I, I I'm curious. What was, what was the actual influence? How did you decide to m- turn that in? I mean, I understand the story turned into a joke, but how did you realize? Yeah. That you know, that's the joke. That that's what you want to be putting up in front of an audience. Did you figure that out instantly? Did your friends tell you? You know what? It's a no, joke. Everything takes forever. Everything takes forever. It's like, you know, I just had this thought. I mean, I'll tell you behind the scenes of it. Uh, the initial joke. So this is how a joke happens, right? It starts with this initial thought. I got cheated on by a girl, and I had this thought of, oh, I'm really hurt. But at the end of the day, we still had a relationship. So I guess I'm thankful. Hmm. That was its initial thought. Very early on, I was found out from crowds. Most people do not react to being cheated on like I reacted to being cheated on. People get very upset. <laughs> so I was like, OK, that does not that is not good. Uh, <laughs> it was like so I had to start like maneuvering it. So I changed it to this like birthmark because that was a little bit easier. Right. Yeah. It was like it was birthmark. She broke up with me. Crowds were able to handle it. So I was like, all right, we switched it there. Then I just really, it was all about this point. I was trying to make a point. And that's what I do a lot in my standup. I sort of usually write the point I'm trying to make first. And then I figure out how I'm going to get there. And so I sort of got into this place where I was like, I remember just sort of maneuvering it and kind of 
getting into it and then being like, she's giving you something for free, blah, blah, blah. And I remember, and then at a certain point, the very ending with the big black sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> I forget how that, I forget how I wrote that, but it was like, that took a lot, that took a lot of experimentation and a lot of like, you know, not how do you say something kind of dirty without like making it filthy and yeah. that that took like some pra like different test ways of being like how do you say yeah how do you say it in a way that isn't like horrific and fair to her and also in power like the thing i also figuring out that like and again it's working through your own stuff almost like again it's a lot of therapy it's a lot of me being like why am I angry at this girl? I shouldn't be angry at her. You know, she made a decision. I disagreed with it, but like she still, and it was all that. And it led to this, I think, very empowering joke at the end of the day Yeah. about like being in, I stand by the point. Again, it's like the thing I do where I'm like, stand by this joke. If you're in a relationship with someone and you break up, that is not a reason to hate that person. You should be thankful for the time you had. That is a good thing. And, uh, you know, so, but it took, it just took a long time of trying to figure out how to say that joke. But it started with being cheated on. Yeah. And I wonder, have you met this girl again ever since? Have you seen, have you, have, has she found out that yeah. she's the girl you were talking about? No, because it's, I do a lot of stuff where I, I don't like making, I don't want to make anyone to feel bad about my comedy. That's not my goal mm -hmm. in general. And I guess this is something I have is like, I never want anyone. It is truly in my core. I never want someone to be hurt by my comedy. That's yeah. not what I mean. That, that's not, I didn't get into this to hurt people's feelings. Yeah. There are comics who got in there because they're like, I like roasting people. I'm not one of those people. I, I really genuinely like making people laugh. I like making people happy. So I changed so many tiny details about this girl and actually then combined another section of the joke is about another girl. Oh. And so it's kind of combines two different girls. Neither of them have figured out the jokes about them. It's one weird threesome right there. <laughs> it's weird. No, they're very confused. They, they, but they don't know. They don't know what. I mean, yeah, because because the, the one, the one who should have figured it out. It's she just it because it's about something else, and it's also not me. It's not about. It just she just hasn't. She's sure. she and she likes the joke. The joke's empowering. It's also everybody who I've dated who hears the joke is like, oh, what a lovely sentiment. So it's like nice, you know, it's, I've actually, yeah. it's led to nothing but positive conversations. Oh, I'm also friends cool. with a lot of my exes. So, yeah. <laughs> so how did you get into uh, stand up then? Uh, I mean, through, through, through it all, like what, I mean, you said you like making people laugh and like, was, was there something like when you were younger that, you know, ticked you where you're like, ah, oh, that's cool. I want to do this. Or what, what was, yeah, I mean, what was, I was super your there? I was super into Jerry Lewis as a kid and like Buddy Hackett. Like I was really into the classics. And then, you know, Dane Cook hit and that made a big difference. I'm from Virginia. So, mm -hmm. you know, as much as I know your comics are supposed to be like, you know, I grew up on Lenny Bruce and Bill Hicks. It's like I did it. I grew up on Dane. Dane Cook hit really hard for me. Um, and I was like, oh, comedy is really I knew I wanted to do acting. I knew I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to do comedy. I didn't quite know how. I went to New York City for college. I start doing stand up, but stand up's really daunting. It's a really scary thing. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not, it's not the most welcoming place out of the gates because so many people try it and leave. The thing you learn when you get into it is like so many people try it and leave within six months. It isn't that I'm ever being mean, but like if I see somebody for the first time, I'm not, I just assume they're probably going to quit. Yeah. They're probably going to give up. It, you know, I tell everyone who's starting stand up, I'm like, look, if you're around for six months, every comic will start being nice to you. We just don't, it, it, we're never going to be mean. We just don't know you. And we're going to assume you're going to quit because it's because you should, because it's horrible. It's a How horrible lifestyle. When you were the first, when you, when you were a first timer, a second timer, a third timer, when you mm -hmm. were the not known guy by the other comics and you, when you weren't accepted and you saw these other people drop out, how did you react? I was, I, w I remember being, so that was the thing. I remember being like, I would, you know, I was part-timing it is what I, what it's kind of referred to as where I would do it once or twice a week when I was in college. Yeah. Which is not, not even close to enough. 
and I would take months off at a time because I was super named Robin Sketch. And I was like doing, you know, I was doing call. I was also acting. I was very into, you know, serious acting. So I was like, you know, so everybody was kind of mean to me and but kind of fairly. I wasn't taking it seriously. This is an now that I'm in it, I get very mad when people aren't taking our, our profession seriously. This is what I do. This is the thing I love more than debatably anything in the entire world is I love stand up comedy makes me mad when somebody isn't taking it seriously um to this day if i'm on a show and somebody goes up there and they start just like not telling jokes and belittling the crowd it's like hey you're ruining it you're ruining it for the rest of us so i take it really seriously there i was not taking it seriously and then right as i'm graduating college i'm still part-timing it really starting to get into it but not still part-time and then my friend told this story a bunch of times you might have heard before, but I, my friend was like, um, hey, this guy is taping his first comedy special at the NYU theater. Mm. Never heard it before. He was in 40 year old virgin. It's all I knew about the dude. And I was like, sure, whatever. And I was third row for Kevin Hart's first special. And I was like, it just was like, oh, this is what undeniable looks like. This is what just an absolute monster of a comic looks like on stage. And I remember just sitting there being like, I, you know, at the time I couldn't get auditions, anything, no industry looking at me. And I was like, and this is right when I'm graduating when I use an actor, which is when you really need industry and nobody, nobody cared about me. It was hey. laughable. And I just remember watching him being like, man, I just want to do what that guy does. Mm. And I quit improv, quit sketch, started doing it full time. And the second I started doing it full time, comics were all of a sudden the comedy world kind of opened its doors to me. And not that anybody was like over the moon, but, you know, all of a sudden those doors opened and people treated me nicely. I will say I definitely have tried to. And I think there's a real movement of this, of being a nicer community. I think the community I started off in has gotten better. Yeah. I like to think. So Stop. when you were doing it part time and when you were mm-hmm. a little erratic, with the stand-up what did you do for your own like when you were done with college and you know you needed something to get your bread and butter out of and it was stand-up comedy at the time what were you trying to live off of at that particular period of time before you got into stand-up full-time you know i I just had day jobs like i was i was a big day job guy and then i was doing improv at sketch that was like you know at UCB and then I was doing sketch comedy with Hammercats and NYU and then uh, I had this group called Chess Club when I graduated and then you know and I loved it I loved doing that um, and I was trying to act and I was in this like terrible horror movie and then like a bunch of you know just like stuff but it just wasn't going to pay bill you know it wasn't paying I, I didn't I didn't pay bills with comedy for years and years and years and years and years and years and, years and, years. Mm. and yeah. you have day jobs yeah, and, and now I'm curious. You gave me the perfect transition for it early on. You got into acting. And, you know, you, you were you were there for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about that Dunkin' Donuts ad- ad- advert. Sure. So, so, yeah, yeah. so I mean, you said that paid rent, uh, paid your rent for a while, and I- I'm curious. So after that advert came out, if you were ever walking around with a Dunkin' Donut in the streets... Did any girl ever walk up to you and say, hey, are you that guy? Or did anyone walk no, up to you? Nobody, nobody ever flags who's in a commercial. Fun fact. Hmm. It is like I've been in sports bar. I've been in bars when a commercial of mine has been airing <laughs> and not one person notices. Have you like you up? just don't notice who's <laughs> in a commercial. You never notice. Have you ever had a part of you just eating the sit? Yo, guys, that's me. No, because I'm afraid of I, I don't like attention, but it, it is like, if anything, I'm actually like, oh, God, everyone's going to notice, you know, and we have to talk about it. And then it's like. Very, but I was in this one commercial, this I was in this Pepsi commercial with Odell Beckham yeah. and it aired so much during football season. I used to go to this D.C. sports bar to watch games. And I remember just being like every time it would go on. Five times a game, the commercial would air. Mm-hmm. And I would always be like, somebody is going to notice. And nobody ever noticed. You don't pay attention. 
like you'd think you do. Nobody ever noticed that Dunkin' Donuts commercial. Nobody ever. I've never. Parents notice. Family and friends notice. It's very exciting. Like if you recognize someone in commercial. Yeah. But random people, you do not clock who's in commercials. Hmm. That's interesting because, uh, you know, I've, I I spoke to this other guy. I mean, I tried doing this little commercial at one point uh, when I was when I was a kid. Uh, mm-hmm. Some guy, my parents knew, found me cute for some reason as a, as a baby and told me to get sure. into this ad for this uh, for some fried food and whatnot. And my parents were like, okay, it was a little bit of quick cash. And yeah. we did it. So, I mean, we got into it. And um, it was, uh, I mean, I speak, so India has multiple different languages. And this was, mm-hmm. uh, so I'm in the East. And this was an advert. And the East has another language, primarily speaks another language, Bengali. And the primary language okay. in India is Hindi. There's multiple other languages all around the place. And How it, many languages do you speak? I speak uh, English, uh, Hindi, a little bit. My mother's my mother's primarily speaks Hindi. My father's Bengali, uh, a Bengali through and through, um, which is so, uh, so in the state of West Bengal, all of those people are Bengalis. Uh, so uh, I am part Bengali and part, uh, I think, North Indian. I'm not too sure because I have a very complicated tree that way. In fact, uh, I mean, a little bit of insight there. That is my entire paternal family tree right there. And wow. Yeah. So look at that. Yeah. And very nice. And right there, if you, I mean, you can't see it there, but that right there is where my name is. And nice. It, and it's generations and generations of, you know, and where you're supposed to know where this guy's your aunt, uh, this guy's your sister's cousins, uh, hu- husbands, someone, someone is related to you in this way and that way. And when you don't recognize them, there's that awkward conversation conversation. So you just go, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you. I know you. I just don't recall your name. And then your mom, and then I get my mom to walk in and she just, and, Oh yeah, he knows you. He knows you. And it's very awkward that way. But anywho, so there's this, so it aired in South India where they speak another language. It was in Tamil and I don't speak that language at all. So what they did was they just made us speak, say twinkle, twinkle, little, little star and just speak. And some guy, uh, some, uh, some guy did a voiceover into my voice over there. Wow. And yeah. I, I, I still, I still haven't watched it though. I was. I mean, I, I heard this is what it was from, uh, I mean, oh, so I'm told um, uh, it yeah. was voiceover or something or there was music over it. I'm still not sure if it was a guy talking over me or whether it was a song. I'm not too sure. And it aired. I only saw one clip of it, like the raw clip on mm-hmm. on the camera in the studio. And I hadn't seen it since and I still haven't. All I had was that paycheck saying that you know i this guy g- gave me this amount of money for doing this yeah, yeah. and that's the only memory i have of it and commercials really disappear into the world you have to i've had to like hunt down some commercials i've done yeah i still haven't found it i, I, I was quite bummed out about it because i i, I searched tooth and nail for it and th- there was a part of me that you know uh that i after a point i thought you know i want to try acting at some point a little bit and mm-hmm. I tried hunting for these auditions and stuff, and it's harder than it looked. I mean, I hunted for getting quite- auditions is really hard. Like yeah. it is something that nobody talks about in Hollywood because a lot of Hollywood is made of people who had connections or something like that. So they sort of start getting auditions. That's yeah. where they start. And what they don't, what people don't talk <clears throat> about is if you don't have a connection to this industry, just getting an audition, the opportunity to audition takes so much effort. To this day, I still have to fight for auditions. The opportunity to be rejected. It is still hard for me. This far in my career, I still have to ask and like really fight to to audition. It's hard. It's it's a real problem. I hear you, man. Yeah. And I mean, let's say getting the audition and not getting the part or the entire project was scrapped. That's something I often heard. And mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of weird that, that whole process because there's so many people just like you who want to do the same thing for the same part. And mm-hmm. it's just this huge hodgepodge of, you know, I wish this guy the best, but I want to get the better of him. And it's, it's, it's a very weird situation sitting in that back room because, I mean, I'm not, 
I have don't really have any experience of sauce, but my little time having experienced it, like sh- like being there for like a short while. Uh, I mean, I haven't been. I mean, like I said, not a long time, but the amount of time that I was there in it in that whole atmosphere for, it's a very very complex like a very different feeling because you don't know whether or not to uh, how you should conduct yourself in there because. you know there's no one else allowed in there and i was and i was a kid i was like a foot shorter than i am right now and right and there, there there's like these guys that and people were like towering over me walking in and oh it was so weird and it it really made, and like i said like i told you earlier it, it finding out those little things like even from that story about the stand up it made me realize how much goes into those uh, those little finer details in the stand up industry the acting industry and even even as you mentioned you know figuring out that that just this part about the black sandwich part of that joke i mean that particular key i mean i started laughing at the sandwich bit at first and then i like laughing 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 suddenly the black sandwich bit uh, came in and then i like oh shit that's hilarious and then i started laughing even more and then and like that little nitty gritty it, it it could have taken like hours or, or days or weeks to to formulate for that extra 15 seconds mm-hmm. of laughter at max or less and you know and you have to develop those jokes for an hour an hours worth and that's assuming all of those jokes are successful all of those jokes will be well received by the audience which they are yeah <laughs> yeah no it's hard it's really hard but it's uh, you know but it's exciting to get to do doing your yeah. first special is a big deal feels feels exciting Yeah so well I mean of course you're full force ahead with this that this that's come out right now so other than the this special are you are you, at the moment are you looking toward just full force ahead with this special and promoting it to the best of its best of its abilities or promoting you- the special is definitely my biggest thing um and then you know we're the industry is opening back up over here slowly so you know starting to act again uh start you know starting to you know writing things pitching do it doing all the things i do but um it's still slow it's still yeah. slow here like we're still there's still such limited things that are in production so it's you know i also another thing is like it's hard to really control acting yeah. acting jobs come when they come and you do the best you can when you get a self tape but it's hard to it's hard to have an impact on that it just has to happen it's hard to do um you know pitching stuff that that is a crap shoot etc but stand up something i can always control it's the easiest to control yeah. so working on working on new jokes figuring that kind of stuff out like that's what i always put my energy into and in writing new scripts so we're just working and you know very optimistic right now about the world and that we're able to you know start working again yeah so that's that's where we're at we're just optimistic right now we're believing in the world Yeah. And uh yeah, if we're doing plugs right now. Yeah. I don't know if we're Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to stop you right there because yeah. this is I, I mean, it's this is usually where we go into like the conclusion segment, which is why, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to go into that little phase of, you know, the thank you bit and all of that jazz. So Sure, of course. Yeah, so let's get that going. So thank you ladies and gentlemen all of you for watching and, you know, Thank you so much for joining in Danny uh, uh Danny oh, and you know so it was much. a pleasure having you on uh you know I hope I hope uh, you liked it here and I hope I can have you back at some point or another and you know everyone else honestly do go check out Danny uh Danny special it's on his YouTube channel I'm going to link it down below followed by the link to the video itself uh you know I watched a lot of it myself and uh you know in fact right after this I have free time myself and I'm going to finish watching it honestly mm-hmm. and uh you know once again thank you for joining in and what i always do with my guests before we do close is i give them the floor for the last few minutes whatever the, the you want to say curse you want to plug someone you want to shout uh you want to shout someone out oh whatever you want to do last few minutes or you go for it oh wow well uh yeah so i would add um i would just say first off please give uh the special watching the special and if you enjoy it sharing the special is the biggest thing anyone can do for me right now i so 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 appreciate it um i'm really proud of it 
could have put it behind a, you know, there were so many different places it could have gone that would have been hard for people to see. And I just wanted it out there. So I so appreciate people checking it out if you have the time. Number two, following me on social media means a lot, really helps sharing stuff, all that stuff. Like it, it, it seems silly. And I know it's like difficult. It's like, I hate it too, but it matters to industry how many followers I have. And it's to me shouldn't, but it does. And so, uh, you know, people are like, what can I do to support you? And I'm like, if you just follow and share things, that is more than like a Patreon or whatever. Like, I don't have that. I don't do a ton of merch. Like my thing is like, I don't need your money. I just need you to, to be a, being a support, being a fan and supporter is means so much more to me than giving me any amount of money. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'm going to say is this, and I say this on every podcast I do, um, stand-up comedy is like hockey. It is uh, wonderful to watch on TV, but it's just a different, better experience live. If you have not experienced live stand-up comedy, go look up your local comedy club. Yeah. You don't worry about the, you don't have to worry about who's there, what's there. Just look up a headliner who looks remotely funny to you and go see them live. Live stand-up comedy is the best art form on the planet. Go experience it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much once again for coming on. And yeah, I will be linking everything down below. And, you know, as Danny did say, you know, it's and as we've been talking about this for the past hour or so, you know, uh, there's a lot more to stand up than meets the eye. And, you know, it takes a lot, a lot of work to, you know, sum up and get the one thing that you want to put out to the crowd to get the laugh out of it. There's a lot of heartbreak that goes to a lot of demoralization that we spoke about. So, you know, uh, uh, and you know what? We I can go I can go into this loop for days, but you know you can just rewind and watch watch what we said again. Uh, quick quick uh, watch time I will get then. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And yeah, uh -huh. once again, thank you very much, Danny, for joining in. This was all for now. I honestly, Danny, I do. It was a, a pleasure chatting with you uh, today. And you know, I think and I really hope we can have you on some other time as well. Uh, you know, maybe sometime sooner when yes. this, uh, when your special does blow up as well, which I'm sure it will. So yeah, so. Uh, thank you for joining in. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching in. That's what that was. And we'll see you on the next one.